I think now we can begin. So we're going to start this off in a more lighter manner um, before we get into the questions, because some of these questions are quite, quite deep. Um, so the first is for Alkesh. Um, given your experience with the foundation for this long and having worked in different sectors from HIV to sanitation, the most important question we have for you today is arranged versus love. <laughs> Which is it? I suppose I'm biased by my personal experiences, which is that I met my wife on a blind date and we got engaged within five weeks. And uh, there's been no looking back. So for me, it's always love. And as simple as that. He, remember, he didn't say for collaboration. Huh? This is just <laughs> on a personal level. Um, now, Madhu, no introduction needed. Um, for Madhu, for those of you who don't know, Madhu is a big fan of crime, murder, uh, series. murder series, some rather graphic ones as well. Um, so with that, the question for Madhu is, given you have um, such deep passion for that, in the sector today, if we were to take one of your favorite shows, Elementary, even though the solutions for this problem are definitely not elementary at all, um, who would you... Who would you see as your Sherlock Holmes and who would be your Watson? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think I'm sitting with the two Sherlocks Ooh. right here. Yeah. And I think I am in the role of the Watson. Oh. Because as everyone knows, I'm not the subject expert on sanitation. I, I have some skills and I'm learning so much. Uh, but there are also plenty of Sherlocks within this room. Uh, but I do turn to the two gentlemen on my right uh, more often than not when I have a problem to solve. So I think they're my first port of call. And then, of course, we have a wider team, both in Seattle and, of course, this wide team of partners here. Safe answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brian? To? Okay, let's come to you. Uh, you like Bollywood movies, I hear? I do. Okay, let's test that. The title of the panel on collaboration platforms today was based on this Bollywood movie. Uh, so in English, it was something about an arranged marriage. Uh, and in Hindi, it was Humapke uh, Hai Khan. Oh, yes. <laughs> OK, great. Um, all right, Madhu. Now we get to the deeper questions. Uh, this is, and I read, in a corporate scenario, it is understandable that people do not talk about failure. Why are we not speaking about failure and are learning from the failures more openly amongst the partners, especially when we all share the same agenda? No, I, I think it's a great point. I think when we say best practices, uh, last year actually we had uh, a whole session on failure fest. Uh, where we do want to create, uh, you know, the safe space for people to admit failure. We admit failure as a foundation. Uh, one of the things that we reiterate quite often is that let's learn from each other's mistakes. Uh, and I see that that traction is there. There have been places where we've not succeeded. We've had some failures in Orissa. We've had some failures in Tamil Nadu. Uh, we have to face the problem. And it, it is a challenge for all of us. One of us or the other of us is going to face similar challenges in as we start scaling. Um, so absolutely, we need to have that. And we should figure out a platform. And you know, we have created the platforms. And uh, maybe we'll be more deliberate. And thanks for reminding us that we will be more deliberate about calling out this and making sure that we are able to share uh, what we've learned, what works, what doesn't work, uh, in the whole interest of uh, growing together as a community. Great. The next question is for Brian. Uh, given your role um, in the foundation from a global perspective, the question to you is, what are the learnings you see between the various markets that you oversee? Uh, in terms, in some of the examples, in terms of the difficulty to achieve some of the outcomes that the foundation is hoping for, and specifically, if you could maybe use the example of the work in Africa versus India to talk about the two different markets and how the foundation has been able to see them differently and learn. 
so we are seeing uh, quite different um, uh, levels of engagement across different countries where we work. Um, what we've learned is that uh, political will is just a huge dynamic, a huge factor in making progress. And so um, in 2014, when Prime Minister Modi made sanitation such a, a big focus, we saw that window of opportunity. It's frankly what enabled us to uh, meet to um, request the budget and the ability to hire some people, uh, such as Madhu and Sakshi here in, in India, to take advantage of, uh, of this opportunity. And, and so the engagement on policy has been tremendous. Uh, Roshan could talk at great length about um, the, our work in Bangladesh and again how some work on the ground coupled with um, some really positive engagement and finally some championing at the national governmental level really helped to move the policies uh, forward uh, quite quickly. And then frankly when we were at FSM4 just uh, last year, the examples of Bangladesh and even more importantly India were what spurred the government of Nepal to take FSM and non sewer sanitation much more seriously. In fact, the uh, uh, minister went back and immediately engaged on, the, um, uh, on, the, on, this, on this space and drove you know, budget allocations and made other changes. So on the policy front, South Asia has been actually pretty dramatic over the last few years. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been harder to engage the, the same level uh, uh, of, of national government attention. But where we have it, we see uh, great progress. So for instance, in Senegal, we've been working there for over eight years, nine years, and we understand uh, the government there, we understand the national utility on us, and we have a great partnership with them. And so that has led to tremendous opportunities that, we have, that, that are in, you know, not as easy to come by across uh, uh, other countries in Africa. We do spend time uh, on the team back in Seattle thinking about how can we learn from what's happening in India and package it up in ways that we can make it more compelling to our partners in other countries and to the national governments in other countries. Because really what's happening in this country, is the biggest challenges in sanitation, but frankly some remarkable progress in a very short period of time. Great. Thank you. Alkesh, <clears throat> you oversee multiple portfolios uh, under the BMGF head. How do we drive synergy between BMGF's different initiatives, for example, WASH and gender, or are they destined not to meet? So I think there are uh, a lot of uh, areas which are common. Uh, what we figured out is that one platform which is just common across many of the areas that we work in, whether it's uh, WASH, gender, financial inclusion, even health or agriculture is uh, to work with self-help groups. Uh, and we are trying to see how we can have common platforms for that. Uh, that's just one example. Okay, great. Okay. This is for Madhu. Um, the foundation, and especially over the last couple of years, we have talked, you guys have talked a lot to the partners about having an exit strategy. Um, be it in three years or five years or whatever is uh, practical. How would the foundation look at um, an exit strategy in terms of the outcomes you have here? What would be the clear goalpost you have for an exit strategy, irrespective of the time, three years, five years, or seven years? Uh, I think we've been very clear about our goal. Uh, we need safely managed waste to be at a percentage and the country on a trajectory mm -hmm. to achieve the SDGs that we are all aspiring to do as a global community. We are, we are holding back if we, as India don't achieve those. So for the foundation, that's kind of the goals that we aspire to do uh, right now. As we speak, our co-chairs are at the UN talking about the goalkeepers and uh, holding the entire global community uh, accountable to achieve those goals. So we are as bought into that. Um, as in terms of an exit strategy, of course, we'd like to see that India is able to sustain the momentum that we've created uh, along with all of our partners. And that partners are, you know, have the institutional capabilities uh, to do that. And whatever we need to help them do that uh, is what we aspire to do over the next four or five years. And just one added to that for Alkesh is in terms of some of the other programs like Avahan, where there was an exit strategy. How do you, what were the lessons you learned from that that now will inform some of the way you're thinking about sanitation? Yeah, yeah. So I'd uh, highlight maybe two, three lessons. The first is that uh, 
it requires uh, lots of discussions with government to agree on itself on, for example, what the exit strategy should be. Uh, after that, it's not a switch that goes on and off. That's the second lesson. Uh, it's like literally a three, three to five year period to agree to exit because it means handing over capabilities, seeing how the government's going to take over those, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the way we did it in Avahan, we said that, look, we'll hand over 10% of what we are doing in year one, 20% in year two, and 30% in year two, and 70% in year three. So it took, uh, took three years after we had negotiated uh, to actually do the handover. The last lesson was that uh, one part of what we do is working with government. The other part is what we do is often working with uh, communities on the, de on the demand side and with our partners. And we, at least in Amahan, we felt there was another role there, uh, which we continued even beyond that three years for a few more years. Uh, so I think often our programs are pretty large and it would be responsible to just say it's a switch that turns off and on and it takes at about five years to exit responsibility is my view. Uh, this is the next question and it's for Brian. Um, the question has been written really, really long, but I'm going to, I know where this is going. Um, as we talk a lot about FSM here as being the sort of central um, focus for the foundation, the question of grey water comes up. Uh, so the question here is really looking at what is the foundation's views on including grey water and how does that also affect the way we're positioning FSM? Great. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, if we had unlimited resources, we would probably have another team that was focused on solving grey water problems. Um, in fact, there are other adjacent issue areas where we know there's so much um, opportunity for joint engagement, whether it's drainage, uh, so, uh, solid waste management, but grey water probably the closest. We, and so it's really a question of focus, um, especially in terms of, uh, we, we, we deeply believe that, um, that in the long term, separating black water from grey water uh, is the way to go. So you immediately, by removing and treating kind of the, the fecal contamination black water, uh, everything gets better. Drains get cleaner. Um, the amount of contamination at all points uh, in the environment uh, drop down tremendously, and you actually open up opportunities to have cheaper solutions. So uh, smaller bore sewers that are sol that, that are solids free, uh, decentralized treatment, treatment of gray water. They can be a lot cheaper and uh, less energy intensive than uh, than wastewater treatment plants. So we think that over the next decades around the world, you will see separation of gray water and black water leading to um, more cost effective, energy effective, uh, and more resilient solutions. So, um, so we, we hope that we are catalyzing on the technology, in our technology portfolio, catalyzing a bunch of solutions that kill pathogens in waste. Um, and we would love to see others uh, uh, catalyzing the same kind of innovation around uh, gray water recycling. Um, so there are bits and pockets of innovation. Uh, I look forward to certainly in the future, uh, a world where maybe a reinvented toilet is taking care of the, um, uh, of the fecal waste and you'll have apartment level or even household level um, gray water uh, um, recycling systems that are actually greatly diminishing the amount of water that needs to get pumped to and from households. Uh, so I think we'll see a lot of innovation in years to come. Uh, whether or not we get a chance to be leaders in the gray water uh, revolution or, or not uh, uh, will we'll still to, to be seen. Uh, our job for now is very uh, focused on uh, fecal contamination. But we know that many of you in this room are experts in both, and we're very thankful for that. This is a question for Madhu. Given the strong traction uh, at, in states for building FSTPs, what is the foundation's view on what the partners should focus on? Uh, I think the biggest message that partners will take back is that FSM is not just an infrastructure problem. I think we all agree that that. It is a service delivery of safe sanitation. FSTPs is one part of the solution. And I think that's what the partners, that's the biggest challenge. Because the one thing that governments love are infrastructure projects. Uh, it's something they understand, it's easy to do. The service delivery that re is required in order to make that infrastructure work for the city is the hard part. 
and that's what partners are doing already, are demonstrating, uh, will continue to demonstrate. We have what we have our CY cities, the citywide inclusive sanitation. Those are the model cities that we'd like to showcase what those service delivery models will be like and then quickly replicate that and even when they're not CY cities, all of our partners at the, on the ground level. That's where I said the implementation muscle is not just of setting up the infrastructure, but actually making that infrastructure work for the city. And also creating the right ecosystem for quick innovation uh, and be nimble about that because we haven't had innovation for a long time in sanitation and I think there's so many imperatives right now, especially around climate change, water sustainability, energy saving, that we actually need to play a big role in this and get, th get those messages out. All right. So we all know what we need to focus on. Uh, this is a question for Alkesh. Um, given that the coming year is an election year, um, what is it that the foundation can do or is doing and with, by yourself and with partners to start engaging with the government to really push the narrative, especially for um, sustaining investment uh, all the way to 2025 with a shift towards more treatment here? You know, uh, I think the context has, is that the government itself has realized that it's not that uh, everything should stop into 2019 and the government itself has a plan to say how do we sustain Swachh Bharat and whatever we do is in the context of that. Uh, and I think Madhu and team haven't changed their message, which has been consistent all along, which is that the next step is ODF plus, ODF plus plus, as all of you know, and that now treatment, in fact, it, the message becomes easier because as the government says that we are reaching our goal of 80, 90, 100% ODF, they would want to go to the next thing, which is ODF plus. So I'm not too worried about the elections and whether there'll be a change of policy. And I say this also in the broader context that if you look at how India has gone over the last 20 years, every, successful, every successive government doesn't scrap old schemes and continues and tweaks old schemes. So I'm pretty confident that that will happen and I can give you many examples from uh, Aadhaar to Narega to uh, NRLM. So I think NRLM for me is the best example that what successive governments do is they take old schemes and add an important component which they think mirrors what they would like to focus on. So NRLM, for example, has been run by the government of, the erstwhile government for more than five years. The, this government said, we think it's important and we think what's important is jobs. And therefore they've added livelihoods uh, as a key component of NRLM, which wasn't that focused earlier. So I think the same thing will happen as far as sanitation is concerned. Okay, great. Yeah, I think we're going to actually now open it up for a couple of questions uh, from the audience here. So. We have some mic runners. Uh, we have mics up here. So if you could direct, direct your question to one of the panelists or just let them know this is for all the panelists here. And remember to ask a question. Yeah, not statements. Good afternoon. This is Sujaya. Uh, so this is, I think, for Brian. Uh, so one of the imperatives in our journey that we all agree and we mentioned is about institutional strengthening. And we also, there was a question earlier, but my question is that how do we build capacity for cities so that they are empowered, you know, to take this journey forward on a sort of cruise control uh, way when in terms of resources, human resources, technical knowledge as well as financial, uh, once BMGF has, is not, that backing is not there for the partners, for the PMU support, etc. So is there a long-term strategy uh, so that uh, for institutional st strengthening at scale, not only for the states that uh, BMGF is involved right now, but for the other states as well? Yeah, of course, that, this is the, the, the big question, it's, and, it, and it's a significant challenge. Uh, three different things come to mind in terms of different avenues for, for building a sustainable future. Um, the first one is just doing everything we can to uh, actually help governments themselves build their own capacity. Um, and 
I'll, I'll come back to, the, to, to that in, in a minute. The, the, other, the other two, one is, is uh, providing um, mechanisms for training uh, of people at all levels. Uh, it's interesting, you know, there are, there are countries in Africa that don't have a single uh, wastewater treatment plant, but their civil engineers get trained in their universities about wastewater treatment plants and nobody gets trained about fecal sludge management. So Roshan could talk at great lengths about all the different levels of um, curriculum that we've been involved in uh, developing over the last few years with partners like uh, uh, like uh, IHE Delft, uh, partnering with many universities across South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, on a master's program in, uh, um, in fecal sludge management, and, um, but also in many smaller duration programs. Uh, and then we've also engaged with partners like uh, the ADB Institute who are already actively training government officials, but there's no FSM curriculum uh, in all of their trainings. Now there is, um, so that people who are being trained just in general urban management and urban planning will get an understanding of the importance of sanitation, why it needs to be a higher priority, and not just uh, learn about um, uh, sewer systems. Uh, so the curriculum development, I think, is a very important component. Uh, and then, frankly, the, the um, building of capacity of the organizations, many of whom are represented in this room, so that governments have partners that they can really lean on and understand your capabilities and have the relationships. Uh, because what we've seen is it's not a question of the government not having the funds to get the job done. It's many times not having an awareness of where the capacity really is and where the expertise is. I think of one of, one of my remarkable learnings over the past few years is how the development, for instance, of a program management unit uh, at the national level or, or technical support units at state levels, really a huge component of value is just providing a mechanism, an avenue, whereby governments can learn from you. Uh, and and uh, so how to get that to be more of a natural um, uh, opportunity and, and, and proclivity of the government to leverage all the expertise that's already close at hand in country. You know, in India there's so much more expertise than there is in other countries where we work. Um, but I think that one of our, uh, the things we need to do between now and whenever our exit is, is make sure that those channels of engagement between government and, uh, and all of you uh, are that much stronger. Do we have any other questions? Go ahead. Yes, hello, good afternoon. I have a, a question for Madhu Krishna. Uh, Madhu, we have been engaging with Indian uh, government recently. Uh, do you see any indicator that government is willing to open up the wastewater sector, fecal sludge management uh, to the private sector, or is it still a kind of uh, grip of the government on, on all levels, municipalities, state, center, that it is regarded a, a public um, domain? So one, of course, the big challenge is first for the government to take ownership of the fecal sludge management agenda. That's something that we're making slow progress on. Uh, I think they would be very happy to provide, you know, shift this responsibility onto the private sector. Um, anyone would be, any municipality, they don't seem to have the resources. Uh, I think most governments that we see understand that there's a huge role for the private sector to play as a partner. Uh, and that's the model that we would like them to follow. Uh, because you also want the municipalities to take responsibility for treatment for ensuring that it is inclusive and not just serving the needs of where you can make a profit. So I think that uh, is something that we would like to see. Uh, but I don't think there is resistance to the private sector operating these plants. Um, in fact, that's something that municipalities would love. If private sector thinks that this is a profitable business and can do it, that's all to the good. Uh, the thing that the partners uh, would like to work with is that it's inclusive, that it doesn't just serve the needs of those who can afford quality services. So I don't think there's any pushback. 
All right, this Dinesh ji, go ahead. Sorry, this is for Alkesh. Of all the sectoral programs that are that ICO is involved in, how would you rate the WASH program on a scale of one to ten? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. ICO is the India country office. Sorry, just to clarify for others. So I'll I'll go out in a limb and not uh, go beyond your question and say, as far as I'm concerned in my portfolio, I, uh, WASH is doing the best without a doubt. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> if you know Alkesh, <laughs> he's as crisp as it can get. <laughs> so <laughs> One sec, there's a question. All right, where? Do we have a question? Manas, yeah. go ahead. Hi. Um, this is for Brian and maybe Alkesh as well. Uh, going back to the earlier question about the private sector, now that more and more tenders are flowing out for FSM and even and more for FSTPs but also for FSM more generally, uh, how do you see uh, the way the private sector response is shaping up? What are the risks that you see? And do you feel there's a role for the foundation to play a more active role on that side beyond the advocacy and the non-profit uh, space that has been supported so far over the next sort of five years? Um. So we're, we're super excited to see uh, the tenders going out and, and to see that the, uh, the number of uh, existing uh, entities that are engaging on those tenders is, is growing. The number and frankly the, the capacities uh, of them. Now I think you have a lot of companies that know very well how to win government uh, tenders but don't have a clue about fecal sludge management and building an FSTP. Uh, but actually those organizations um, working collaboratively with, uh, with the expertise in this room and beyond, uh, I, I think, is 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 a, is a great path to success. Um, the the fact that so many different states are um, announcing numbers of tenders and amounts of money that are really becoming quite material, uh, what we're seeing is is the private sector react. Uh, now, I, I know part of your question is is there um, is there an opportunity for us to help um, bootstrap the many different um, businesses that are that are that we're going to want to have around and at scale and successful um, five years from now, ten years from now. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting for us as the, as the foundation. It's, it's been hard to successfully, uh, I, I, what I'll say is efficiently, with kind of our limited staff especially, I engage in a company by company basis. Uh, we see so many entrepreneurs that uh, we would love to help and yet engaging and helping them individually is, uh, is really difficult and it doesn't, doesn't really scale well. So, um, so we tend to look for ways that we can use our voice in particular, sometimes some of our budget, but in particular our voice and our convening power to try to kind of help shine a light on, what, on the opportunity and to help uh, smaller organizations that might not be able to get some attention uh, come under a, a broader umbrella that can allow them to get more attention. And I think that there's lots of things that we need to figure out how to do over the next couple of years, so certainly not at all figured out and we're open to ideas. Yeah, so maybe I'll focus on your risk part. So, you know, my experience in the last 15 years is that whenever we run programs, uh, there's a phase which is around policy, design, etc. and then we move towards implementation and now we are in the implementation phase. And the implementation phase always takes 10 times more effort than the previous phase. phase. And uh, it's not intuitive because all of us work so hard even in the advocacy and the policy and the design phase that we, we feel okay we are already working so hard how much more I mean how much worse can it get. right? And I've always seen that the implementation phase takes like much more effort. So now we are in the implementation phase and you know 100 to 200 FSTPs are being uh, rolled out and we might find that it, 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 many of them might face serious challenges uh, in the sense quality may not be good or they are built and then they are not run well except or money is not paid in time or whatever, whatever. There can be hundreds of things and you all I'm sure be called upon to support each city in hundreds of small and big ways. Uh, so I think, yes, it is a very risky uh, part. I think all of us are pretty well aware of it and are trying our best. Uh, we are trying to see that we do specific things to help the private sector. For example, Madhu is just thinking through and 
a grant to see how do we ensure that quality is there in each of these FSTPs being built. So there's that one example, but I think we'll have to think of many things like that, which will tell us where and how things are going wrong. So I think we need, for example, a very good MIS system that tells us by city what's happening, why there might be failures in cities, and then be able to act on it. So that's how I think we should be engaging. Last question. Okay, so you. Is there any more question out there in the group? No more question? You get the last word. Uh, yeah. This is a question for Brian. Hi, I am Ananya. I work in, uh, in Odisha. Uh, so my question is the fact that one of th uh, the major kind of selling points for FSM is the fact that it is not as expensive as Seward systems. Uh, however, uh, do you, how, it's rather like, how do you, push the government to push for FSM when they have a project which is seaward and so, so what ends up happening is that if, you, if the government sees two projects and one is a project which is worth say $1 million and the other one is worth $40 million, they end up in investing their energies and efforts on the $40 million project. So the fact that FSM and FSTPs are kind of uh, less expensive is kind also uh, kind of a bane for us. So how do you uh, do advocacy against that? Yeah, it, it is a challenge because also it's not just uh, the governments, uh, the lending partners, so the, the development banks also uh, find it more attractive to have an $80 million project than to have uh, $42 million projects. Uh, it's just easier to manage. So, so, so that's, a, that's a challenge. Frank, but frankly, everybody um, wants to make more progress more quickly. And I think that um, it, every, with, 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 um, with every step we take, we have more kind of um, evidence that you can reach people very quickly by engaging uh, in great fecal sludge management plans uh, at, at lower costs. And governments absolutely like that. So uh, one, one problem is, I think, because we're so focused on non-sewer approaches, um, it comes across that we don't think that there's a, that there's a place for, uh, for sewers. There absolutely is. Um, and so we're not saying that stop investing in sewers. We're saying if you really want to kind of reach the SDG goals, you have to invest in uh, better approaches uh, to reach the non-sewered. And that in terms of reaching more people more quickly and, uh, and less expensively, you can make a lot more progress by um, investing in non-sewered at, at the same time. Uh, and so we're really trying to say do both um, and, uh, and try to pr help you know, provide some guidance for how to do the non sewer But it is challenging. One of, one of the approaches that we're seeing, uh, we hypothesized maybe a couple years ago and we're now seeing it take place is, is bundling. Uh, governments are not putting out to tender one FSTP, they're putting out bundles of FSTPs. Uh, development banks are not thinking about doing non sewer for one town, they're bundling them together to get some economies of scale. And we think that's, that's really important and that's going to help us out. You know, I'll just add one thing, which is I think the markets for right now, the way the governments are thinking about it, the markets for uh, FSTP kind of solutions and STP solutions are different cities. So typically the FSTPs are being built in cities which are 50,000, 100,000, 20,000. And those cities are too small for the government to say we'll put up a sewer, sewerage network, STP system. So I think that's how it's playing out. Okay. Um, I think with that, we'd like to thank the panel. This was a really, really good session and a good conversation.